amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually here wearing two hats. Um, I'm manning a booth out there on behalf of MTC because I manage the Bay Area's 511 carpool program. Um, but in the other part of my job, um, I actually got really interested in driverless vehicles a couple of years ago um, when I started just reading about it. And it was way less on the radar back then. This was like two and a half years ago. But the implications for government agencies are actually really huge, but rarely talked about. And more so now, but back then, not at all. So I applied for an internal research fellowship in my company to study this topic, and I got the um, fellowship, and I ended up writing a guide for how government can prepare for it. So this is largely kind of a summary of what's been, what's been found with um, some added color of what's happened over the last few years. So I'll start with my favorite graphic. Um, it is true, and you heard this from the, the couple of introductions too, driverless re vehicles really are coming very quickly, and I'll talk about the timeline. Um, so what I'm gonna, I'm gonna say very quickly, I'm a New Yorker, I'm gonna talk fast, is driverless vehicles 101, just some basic information. I think it's important to lay that groundwork. Um, what is the future gonna look like and then what can government actually do? So um, first, starting with driverless vehicles 101, just what are they? You'd be amazed how often I get asked what are driverless vehicles. Um, so the US Department of Transportation came out with this official definition when they put out their policy guidance back in September. Um, I think really the key thing is that it does, does not necessarily involve a human monitoring the activity. And basically, um, driverless vehicles read the world around it. It uses technology like radar, LIDAR, sensors to just read what's around to make the decisions on where to go. It does, does not rely on humans. And because of that, you can see the design of vehicles have the potential to really change. This is um, an image that shows a bunch of people, in quotes, driving, but actually being very productive. So, I think a very important part on the, of the definition is understanding the levels of automation. So this is an international standard that's been adopted by the federal government. Um, so it's level zero through five. So level zero, think about when, driver, when cars first came out. Um, you have to turn the steering wheel to go to turn. You have to hit the brake when you want to stop. That's zero automation. Um, all the way up to level five automation, which is you don't even need to be awake to have the vehicle moving. So, then we fall somewhere in between where you start to see the things that are getting introduced today, partial automation. So features like cruise control, we've had that for years, um, but getting even more fancy with like um, self-parking and adaptive cruise control. So that's kind of where we are today in, this, in the mix, in the middle. So I want to quickly show you a video. So this was a video that someone happened to take on a highway, and this was just in the last few months. Um, where if you can see that driver, and I'll say driver in quotes, is fast asleep. And this person, you can imagine on watching it, realized they had to take a video of it. So I, the reason I show you this video is partially, let me just ask, how many of you think this is a level five fully automated vehicle? <laughs> I've, hopefully the laughter is reflecting the fact that it's really not. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, Really, where we are today, um, there are no level five fully automated vehicles out there. Because um, th right now, you actually are required to have a driver holding onto the wheel, put ready to step on the brake if needed. So what this, this person is actually completely illegal what they're doing. But it does reflect where the industry is at, where they're challenged with people just thinking like, wow, this car can do it without me. I don't need to be awake. So it is, it's a real regulatory issue. Um, so, which brings us to the race. Um, if you read any headlines around driverless vehicles, you can see there's a constant race of which country is gonna get ahead, which state, which city, which automaker, which technology developer, who's doing things first, who's getting it out there. Um, and it's all about the headlines. But the real question is, what is the actual timeline? So, um, this graphic shows that we're gonna see full autonomous or level five capability between 2018 and 2022. And I think that's a generally agreed upon timeframe in that most of the automakers are actually making that commitment that we will see them become publicly available then. What I think is very interesting about this graphic is that it predicts 100% autonomous penetration in 2026, that's less than 10 years from now. That's actually pretty aggressive and that's actually why I like to show this forecast. There are literally hundreds of forecasts out there with all kinds of crazy guesses. Um, this is really aggressive just because the average age of a vehicle is about 11 years. Um, it seems kind of crazy it could happen this quickly. That being said, people do think it could happen just if you look at how technology in general is getting adopted. Um, most estimates I would say hover in the 30 to 40% penetration around 2030. 
Um, but that should show you it really is happening very quickly. And I'll also point out, um, if you look at transportation plans around the country at all levels of government, they look out 30, 40, 50 years, and the majority of them don't even have the word driverless in it. So it does reflect the, the issue. So what could this world look like? So first and foremost, safety is by far the biggest cited benefit. Um, right now, over 90% of accidents that happen on our roadways are due to human error. Think drunk driving, distracted driving. So if you eliminate the humans, in theory, we have a much safer, safer roadway. Um, the next thing is changes in roadway capacity. So um, as you can see, when there's flowing traffic, you have kind of standard headways. But then as volume increases, you end up with that standstill. Um, with AVs, in theory, they can move much more closely together, so you're actually gonna get more capacity on the roadways. Another question is, will we have segregated road lanes so that driverless vehicles will only operate in certain lanes? Um, another one is the road geometry. In theory, we could have a two-lane highway become a three-lane highway. So. Um, because in theory, you don't, have, you don't need the wiggle room for human error. So the next one is changes in demand. Um, imagine if um, the elderly and disabled had a new way to get around. This is a huge issue. In fact, Japan is making this kind of their headline of why they're getting into this space is to transport the elderly. Um, this is a picture from Google, huge promotional photos that have been everywhere around letting a blind man test their driverless vehicles. Um, Another great opportunity is around reduced car ownership. So imagine if this two-car garage could become more of this like shared economy. And I purposely replaced the Uber logo on the phone with a Muni one, and I like to put, put any public transit agency in there. Um, I think it's also important to note that there are many shifting business models here, and that it, we don't know yet where the services will be provided. The automakers are getting into this space, the technology developers like Uber and Lyft, but the public agencies could too. Um, and then it gets us to where we are today. So obviously developing the technology is still a very important step that needs to happen. Um, when is the technology going to be ready enough for people to be, feel safe to get in them? Um, the next one is human factors. So I'll ask all of you, how many of you would get into a driverless vehicle right now if it was waiting outside of this hotel? Yes. OK, this is a true Bay Area audience. <laughs> and I love that. Um, I gave this talk in Australia and I did not have a single person raise their hand. <laughs> I gave this talk in Connecticut, had one person in a room of 200 people raise their hand. Um, the national average is less than 50% of people would be willing to get into one. So it is very geography dependent, it's very age dependent, but um, I expect that to evolve over the next few years. Um, just to highlight a couple of other things, a big issue is around privacy and security. Who's gonna own the travel data? Who's gonna protect the travel data? Who's gonna make sure that we don't have hackers hacking into driverless vehicles and driving them into buildings? These are all issues that are being looked very looked into. Um, liability, insurance, who's going to be responsible if a driverless vehicle crashes into another driverless vehicle or even more complicated, a driverless vehicle crashes into a non-driverless vehicle. Um, so, which brings us to the future. Um, I would like to ask all of you to kind of put your Jetsons thinking cap on. Um, fast forward like say 50, 60 years, imagine we have all driverless vehicles, okay? So I'm gonna go through two scenarios. The first scenario, it's a Monday morning, I wake up, I get my kids ready for school, and I summon our private driverless vehicle to come from its remote parking space about 15 miles away. So it comes, picks up the kids, and it takes them to school. And then when I'm finished getting ready, it's about the same time that the car comes back, so I get in so that it can take me downtown to go to work. Um, it's great, even though I'm sitting in traffic for most of the time, first I get my workout in on my elliptical trainer, <laughs> then, <laughs> Um, then I still have some time, so I brew some coffee, I start my work day, I have the TV going on the big screen TV, and it's absolutely lovely. So eventually, I get into my office, um, I go up, and I remember that I don't have any groceries available for dinner that night. So I send the driver of this vehicle via my phone to go pick up groceries, but it goes first to one store where it has the cheapest meat, another store to the cheapest place, produce, and another one for the cheapest toilet paper. And then when it's done, it realizes that it has no more um, errands for me, so it goes to a remote parking lot about 15 miles outside of the city. So um, many people describe that as their dream, right? I mean, it is your personal chauffeur, it's amazing, but I think most of us in the transportation world can recognize that this is actually very, very scary. So you're not just having single occupancy vehicle trips, and you're certainly not using public transit in any part of that. You're also adding zero occupancy vehicle trips to the road. So you've now probably increased VMT or vehicle miles traveled 
very, very significantly. Okay, so that's the first scenario, and I call that the nightmare scenario. <laughs> um, now the second scenario. So I wake up on a Monday morning, I get my kids ready for school, and I get them onto their driverless school bus. And then when I'm ready to go, I use my smartphone and I summon a driverless shuttle. And the little pod comes to my door, I get in, it picks up a couple of my neighbors and it take us, takes us to the local train station. And there it is perfectly timed, so I just get on the train, it's seamlessly paid for, I never take out my wallet, and I take the train downtown. And then when I get to downtown, I have about a mile to go to my office, so I get on a bike share bike and I bike that last mile. So then when I get into my office, I realize I don't have groceries for dinner that night. So I use my smartphone and I use something like Instacart and I schedule a grocery delivery for that evening. So um, I call that one the utopian scenario. Um, and really the big difference between these two scenarios is the level of vehicle and ride sharing that's happening. So let's just quickly compare these two scenarios. Um, in both cases, safety in theory will have gone up significantly because we have a fully driverless society, so less accidents. Um, VMT likely to go up very, very significantly in that nightmare scenario, and likely most people predict even in the utopian scenario we'll see an increase in VMT. Greenhouse gas emissions, and I think this is really important, um, driverless vehicles do not necessarily require electric technology. They are two totally separate technologies, so one can't assume that greenhouse gas emissions are going to go down if you have driverless vehicles. Um, Urban sprawl, there is risk of people being willing to live a lot farther from where they work because their value of time has changed with their being in their vehicle. Whereas in the utopian scenario, the idea is that people will be living in more dense kind of um, communities where there's rich transit, so less likely for urban sprawl. Um, parking requirements, this one's interesting. So in theory, in the nightmare scenario, nothing would change with our parking requirements because people would continue to own cars the same way they do today. The big difference is that parking could be relocated. So it might be that in our cities, we, know, we wouldn't bother having the land dedicated to parking. We'd keep it all outside of the cities. But as you can imagine, that would add a lot to VMT. Um, in the utopian scenario, on the other hand, there would be a lot less parking requirements. Roadway maintenance requirements, in theory, would go down for both just because the driverless vehicles accelerate and deaccelerate more smoothly. And then for low-income mobility, this is probably where you see one of the biggest impacts in terms of the nightmare scenario. You could see transit. I, some even say could become obsolete. I think that's extreme, but it would get way worse for low-income mobility versus the utopian scenario where transit would be great. So, um, and I'll get into this in a second, but I would argue that it's actually government's policy setting that will influence where we fall on this spectrum. So, um, which gets me to what should government be doing? So, um, to start, I thought it was important to separate at the federal level versus the state and local level what should happen. Really, you want to see at the federal level things getting addressed that need to happen consistently around the country. So, safety, you know, how will licensing work? Um, privacy and data sharing, cybersecurity, these are all issues that actually the federal government and a lot of academic institutions and a lot of other stakeholders are working on right now. Um, and any standards. I mean, a big issue right now is that automakers are complaining that when states set these rules, automakers are having to respond to different issues in different states, different regulations, so you want to see them addressed consistently. As opposed to the state and local level, where you want to see things that are unique to those areas. So mobility, how do you manage that VMT impact? Um, and I'll talk more about that. Infrastructure. Um, in theory, we might have a lot of changes to parking, where parking is located, the width of the lanes. Um, and then another one is maybe we need more pickup and drop-off locations if we see more of this sharing economy. Um, for transit, I like to say transit is going through an identity crisis right now, even with um, Uber and Lyft and other technology providers. There's, there's a lot changing in the mobility landscape, but I think driverless vehicles are going to have a huge impact. So rethinking where transit is provided, how much it costs, um, how it's provided, et cetera. And finally, financial. Um, this, I think, is often overlooked, but driverless vehicles actually have the potential to really disrupt the financial um, kind of costs and revenues for cities and agencies. So think about speeding ticket enforcement. Think about how many of our cities rely on speeding ticket revenues, and that's something that could completely go away. Um, another one is sales tax revenues. Um, imagine if people are buying less vehicles, the revenues associated with that could go away. So just thinking through the costs and revenue side of it. So what can be done now, and I'll just pick a couple of these, because do I, how am I doing on time? Close. Close, okay. Um, so what can be done now? I think the number one thing is just getting educated on what's going on. I have a very exciting job because I can read new news and changes happening in this space literally every week. Um, it's a lot of fun, but it is a challenge on the government side just to stay up to date. So doing what you can to um, follow what's happening. 
um, incorporate these driverless vehicles into an agency's goals. It may be unclear what's gonna happen, but just acknowledge that an agency wants to reap the benefits of this technology, but also protect against what could be the negatives. Um, establish communications with the stakeholders, and Bijan actually talked about this, how Caltrans is actually starting to reach out to the automakers and technology developers and saying, what do you need and what can we do for you and that kind of thing. I think that dialogue is really important. I like to point out that when Uber and Lyft showed up in our cities one day, government was really caught kind of um, flat-footed, um, and that's not their fault. I mean, they literally showed up overnight. But in this case, we know driverless vehicles are coming, so government is in a position to start talking to them, to engage, to figure out what they need, um, and potentially support testing. Um, and I'll just kind of skip to establishing partnerships is another great opportunity, and I know TAM is doing great stuff with SMART, now announcing the partnership with Lyft. Um, this is a great way to start the discussion and start figuring out what those arrangements will look like, because I think we're gonna see more and more of that as time goes on. Um, what can be done in short and medium term? And I'll just pick a few of these, but um, updating your travel demand model, thinking through the travel impacts and seeing how that will impact your transit and your road capacity needs. Um, looking at things like um, your electric vehicle infrastructure, if that's an important goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I like to mention, this is the last one under infrastructure modifications, certifying roads for driverless vehicle usage. This was by far one of the most controversial things that I put in my guide. It was really interesting. I had some people saying this is absolutely the only way that people are gonna be willing to get into driverless vehicles is if government says these certain roads are gonna be dedicated for that or government says these roads are ready for it. I had a lot of other people saying there is no way that we government wanna be responsible for figuring out which roads are okay for that or even worse being liable for what happens on those roads because it's driverless and quote certified. So I like to keep it in, it is very controversial though. Um, another one I wanna mention is the importance of government updating its workforce to be able to respond appropriately. So one example is driverless vehicles in all of these companies are introducing a lot more data. So government having the ability to process that data and make sense of it is going to be really important. Um, and then finally, and this is my last slide, when I mentioned the importance of government weighing in on how far we go from a nightmare to a utopian, you know, where on the spectrum we fall, this is really where the, the policies that government puts in place could actually impact where we fall. So one thing to manage that vehicle miles traveled impact, government could put in place things like road user charging or high occupancy vehicle lanes, things that will actually help users to understand their impact on the roadway and, and add a, if they are adding to the congestion. Um, another one is to adjust land use policies to reduce urban sprawl. The next one is to um, add any kind of sales tax or fees or anything that will disincentivize people either buying cars or parking their vehicles. So just helping people to feel the pain. And I would argue you can go on the positive, positive side too and incentivize people to do more of the sharing. Um, altering parking policies so that your zoning actually, for example, you don't have minimum parking requirements in your, in your buildings. Um, incentivize electric vehicle usage. And finally, the transit pricing. This is huge. I don't know if you all remember in San Francisco, Uber put out a, a Match Muni campaign and they charged $225. Um, and it was remarkable how many people were choosing to use Uber instead of transit. Makes sense. Um, imagine when the Ubers of the world don't have to pay their drivers. Those costs are gonna go way down. And transit needs to, and I don't like to say compete because I don't think it's competing, but I think it's figuring out what service matches and works best within the mobility environment. So I will leave it at that. Um, um, this is my contact information. I wanted to mention that uh, my company has a website specific to these advancing technologies called advancedtransport.com. Um, I maintain a blog if you're interested in following my random thoughts on this. And I also tweet with news articles, probably like five or eight a day. I um, very actively read in this space, so if you want to follow it, this is a great way to do it. So thank you so much, and I look forward to any questions you have. <laughs>